Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and join the other speakers uh, and just share a little bit about how we do this at Amex. Uh, we're, I think, early a little bit on the mobile team with our telemetry journey, but of course, as kind of has been stated here, our, our back end story with open telemetry, telemetry is much further along. My name is uh, Kylan Johnson. I am the Android SRE lead for the mobile team. Uh, my colleague Ace, who's my iOS counterpart, couldn't be here, but we do uh, we en we lead the engineering effort for manual instrumentation uh, for the entire mobile app, which is uh, you know tens of millions of users, multiple countries, def definitely all the permutations that were mentioned in the prior talks were were right there with them. I actually started being a feature developer. That's how I started at Amex, and we had this opportunity, or at least this desire in some of our leadership to actually learn more about how our app was running at scale. This is a few years ago at this point, but it started with this basic question of how does it feel to use a mobile app? A little bit real user monitoring, um, and we wanted to use telemetry principles, use observability just to, to actually do this. And we wanted to really understand it from the customer's perspective uh, for some of our most traveled journeys. It was really about, um, we have short sessions on our app in general, so we wanted to understand at scale in all the different permutations what a user was uh, experiencing. Now we need to do this, when we started out at, at ground zero, we had zero traces or zero metrics, zero anything um, in the app when we started this, so we said, okay, if we wanna understand how it feels, of course app startup is gonna be the critical thing, your app is not in memory, now it is. In our, in our world, in the Android world, um, we instantiate a lot of, a lot of uh, components at that time, so this can be a bottleneck, and the user can't use your app until it's done. We, uh, we assume that there was a lot of large view loads where we make a chunky server call, and then we get a response, and then it takes however long it takes to actually render the Chrome. And uh, you know, we generally, at this time, were full screen spinnered, so again, you're just kind of waiting for whatever to, uh, to render. Now lately, we've been doing much more um, progressive rendering, um, which is not as common, but this is more in line with user profiles and what users are actually using the device. Um, they might have one to four different requests on one screen, and uh, then are you considering the load to be when the first one is there, when the last one is there? There's a modeling question here that of course we ran into when we started to manually instrument everything. But Beyond that, we, we obviously thought that the server connection was actually gonna be the most critical thing to measure, that it would be the most uh, error-prone thing, that it would, of course, we assume that everybody's going into a subway at any given moment and lo loses all network connection, and so any errors that we might have um, would be a result of the server connection. Now, fortunately for us, our server team is coexistent on our team. Um, we actually build features with the server and the client all at once, so if a, sh if a feature ships on the client, it actually ships on the server too. So you keep a tight API contract there, which is good. Um, so for all intents and purposes, this is the application right here. We would consider the server actually as part of the mobile application because of its tight couple. But of course, uh, the number one journey, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna just basically go back, uh, the most important, the first journey that we did, and a little bit of the lessons learned uh, building this out, building all this telemetry out. Oop, wrong button. You to see this wonderful animation again. There we go. Log and flow. It's kind of the boring flow, but it's also the one that's underlooked. Uh, it, it's maybe overlooked is a better word. Like uh, people, this is the oldest part of the app. It's the architecture that's least compliant to the to the modern everything. And this is the most traveled one, which is a little bit ironic if you think about it. So we're gonna talk about this the rest of the time. We instrumented this journey. We wanted to understand this journey because this is what everybody has to go through and it's largely uh, the most, it's definitely the most important one. But uh, along this whole thing, we, we think that observability should be a first class feature of any application, and everything that was said earlier about mobile apps is completely true, I can tell you from first hand experience. Mobile architectures are polyglot at best, They're, there's probably three versions of them within an application, and it's, it's constantly evolving. But if, and then we are actually a feature team driven uh, organization, development team for, you know, the four or so people that are SREs, there's dozens of, of developers working on the platform. So unless you bake something into your build process, unless you bake something into how you build the software, it's just not gonna get, it's gonna be harder than it should be. So observability being a first class feature means we're testing it, we're, uh, it's, it's baked in the architecture, it's just the way you do things. 
this is just an example. I didn't pull this out to throw any shade. It's just this is the example you're going to get. So if I was going to have to describe to somebody how to make a span, how to produce a span, and then introduce our team to it, this is what I would tell them. And it was interesting to me that it was way more of a cognitive load for them to actually understand this. I mean, they're under pressures with all the things that Google is putting out on a daily basis. And Android is moving very rapidly. So yet another API to learn is, is hard because then they have to actually do the abstract modeling, um, which is something we do on the SRE side, but is not necessarily in their wheelhouse. So we're going to build up a protocol here. This is how we're going to model our login. We're going to send a login request. That's unsurprising. We're going to decode all the JSON um, and then render it, of course, eventually. But first, we're going to scan biometric because, and you'd be surprised at how many people don't do biometric, even though it's very re readily accessible. Um, of course, after all of this was already done, then, of course, we had to implement multi-factor authentication, which was uh, just another bump in the line, and then you get to the logged in view. And I didn't even include half the things that are actually bumps in the line here. So what we thought, of course, is as an easy journey of just getting from login to landing page, it's actually very, very complex. Not to mention Team Biometric did that one, Team MFA did that one, and then, of course, the landing page, it depends on which user you are. Which So when you want to actually, quote unquote, stop the clock, which place in the code is called? Well, it could be n number of them. So this problem is just, it's, it's much more complex than what you might think. So we're just going to go with a basic example of what we did. Um, we've since built on top of this. But this is just where anybody could get started. If you have any architecture in Android, if you're using fragments, ac activities, view models, whatever you're using, you might have a view model. The view model is going to have a login button. That login button is just going to have a login service. And I'm, I'm simplifying this a bit, obviously. But then what we're going to do is we're going to just take a login observer. If you're on Android, you're using dependency injection for all the things. And so you're going to uh, get this login observer and then alongside of what you were doing anyway. So we're just assuming that you were already doing all of this. We're just going to call login received and send it the result of what actually happened. And this is going to be one bump in the line. You're going to do this throughout the application. And you're going to send only the critical things to the observer that need to be modeled. So what we get here is basically just instrumentation via events. We're just abstracting it away to its most primitive kind of shape. And we're just going to take the architecture is very hub and spoke, and it's contributing around the code base. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a network client. As was stated earlier, we have, I think, we're up to like 310 Gradle modules now. Um, some of them are Kotlin, some of them are Android, some of them <laughs> are just holding JSON, basically. There's so many modules. So build, build speed, um, repeatability, ease of readability is, is critical here. So we want a very flexible API to be able to do what we want to do, which is time this event. So, but even beyond that, we want everybody participating in this conversation we're about to have here. So it's, it's very easy for me to get stuck on numbers and traces and everything that's, that's the result. But if you boil it down like this, everybody in the organization can kind of uh, participate in building value here. So of course, when these events are emitted, this is what we're going to build up. We're going to say we started the login. The biometric auth is, is running. Login request is then being issued, which actually stopped the biometric auth span from running. Then we, of course, finish it. Now, the orange one just denotes that it's an HTTP span. That's, that's its only distinction here. But a single event here can then stop and start spans. And these optional spans become very easy to implement then. So before, if you have many, uh, a lot of state and you want to basically instrument a feature, you want to get out of the way of the feature. And if you just have to deal with these signposts that everybody can understand and everybody can um, implement, well, then we can kind of proceed a little bit quicker here. So we're going to start that MFA. Of course, that MFA team now realizes they can actually use metrics. So then they want to count how many times. That's just a trivial example. But then we can add events really easily. We, we've actually built up what you're seeing here over the course of many, many iterations. This wasn't like one and done and we did it. It's, well, now we realize we can do that. Oh, we realize a metric is better here. We realize that um, this is excellent as a, as a spam, but it's hard to um, it's hard to collect at scale. Um, of course, we turn things into metrics. We turn spans into metrics. So we realize we want to time that view interactive, and, and uh, we just keep 
keep bumping along, but this final picture is actually what's the most uh, valuable here because we've had product owners that are really interested in what we see here. Um, developers are more interested in this part than how to get there. They really just want the span to, to turn into this, and it's up to us to, uh, to make it happen. So these simple techniques of turning, um, building into the architecture, we think really help with uh, adoption of just telemetry principles here. Our big lessons learned from all of this is developers should really just be the experts in their features. We're, we're embedded SRE. We're supposed to be the experts in all of this, but we can't necessarily expect all developers to do it. So if you're asking a, a junior developer or a senior developer, I've had both come up and, and, and say they don't know any, anything about spans, what they mean, how do they use them, what the effect of it is. But they do know their feature, and so we can work with them to kind of explain their feature, describe it. Make the architecture more observable first. We just kind of took a trivial example that anybody could do, but iOS is very event loop driven. They are basically an actor pattern, so they have events going up and down all the time, which lends itself to being very observable. They also wouldn't do any dependency injection. They're very against that, they're very functional. So um, if you break it down to these primitives, both iOS and Android can talk at the same terms because we're just talking about starting and stopping clocks. We're, starting about, we're talking about describing what the spans are, not necessarily that it is a span. And if you aren't getting value out of a metric, I think you should constantly review all your metrics. We don't want to turn on auto instrumentation just for the sheer fact that, not that we lose data, but we want to understand what's there and it has to lead us to a decision. If, if some metric or alert or whatever is not leading us to a decision to change code or update something, we want to, we want to remove it, basically. Only thing that should be there is what provides value. And then this is just a basic encapsulation. If you're a software developer, you kind of want to separate the what from the how. An API that we don't control, even though we love open source at Amex, uh, we want to make a clear barrier between um, what is native to the app and then what is just measuring the thing. And that kind of sounds uh, a little bit like it's an open source, why, why not just use open source? Well, we don't necessarily want to draw attention to all these spots in our app because they tend to collect everything. You'll have a local profiler wrapping a span, wrapping a, another version of benchmarking or something. So we want to separate out what is an app level decision versus how we're measuring it. And you can just actually test this. I kind of glaze over testing a little bit. We test everything at scale and even the observability is tested. So if a trace is supposed to be emitted from an, a UI run, we actually assert that it happened. We assert all the child spans on it and we assert uh, you know, just various tags and uh, metadata about it. We really value that. But that is all I have. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions, but I know it is lunch. These are custom, completely custom events. Uh, I actually pulled up more of the events uh, just on my laptop there. We've had to do, we, we are very much that five observability backends kind of story. So I've had, we've had to be adaptable, and that was the main point of this was just to be adaptable. But yes, we, we want to look into the events API. <laughs>